there's never been a better time to have Sirius XM. With even more exclusive content, with over 150 channels in your vehicle, including the widest, deepest variety of music, ad-free. Root for your team. Get news. Listen to whatever makes you laugh. And hear all about your favorite stars. Your Platinum Plan offer includes more than ever before to enjoy online, on your phone, or at home. Create your own ad-free personalized stations powered by Pandora. Hear ad-free extra channels filled with music and enjoy a favorite shows with Sirius XM Video. Thousands of hours of shows and performances on demand. What you love is on now. This month, it's all about high-end audiophile grade gear. And the Italian manufacturer, Audison, is certainly at the forefront of that movement. Join us as we geek out with product expert, Ken Ward, who's joining us today. And we're going to take a deep look into Thesis and some Virtuoso DSP product as well. This is CMA Connected, presented by SiriusXM, Audison. And it starts now. Thanks for tuning in, everybody, to another episode of CMA Connected, presented by Sirius XM. I'm your host, Ben Wu, and yes, it is time to nerd out, geek out, whatever you want to call it. We're talking about audiophile grade gears. It's the session I literally have been looking forward to the most, and each and every day, I'm kind of spoiled. I get to talk with the top trainers about the ultimate high-end offering that they have for their respected brands. Now, today, the focus is going to be about Audison, Italian. Very, very exquisite stuff. And man, I'll tell you, if you've ever seen or had the chance to hear some of the upper echelon uh, offerings in the catalog, well, you're lucky because there's some pretty high grade stuff. Now we're going to dive in. But of course, let's first reach out to their Canadian distributor for all things Audison. We're talking about automobility. First, I'd love to go to Montreal where we have uh, Mr. Phil Cameron standing by, who is their product specialist. Hello, Phil. How are you? Hey, man. Doing great. How about you? Uh, yeah, as you can see, I'm having fun with this this month. If you've been uh, watching at all, I mean, this is oh, yeah. it, it, it's kind of like why we all got into it. We always aspire to play with this higher end stuff. And Audison obviously is very exciting. Uh, what, what does it mean to you, Phil, when we talk when we say Audison? And here we are, a chance to talk with Ken and like talk about just that top tier stuff. Uh, to me, it's the it's the stuff that you always dream on, like installing, but you never got to install. So I'm uh, looking very much forward to this presentation by Ken. But uh, having to play with this stuff is simply amazing. And amazing. If, if I know you, Phil, you probably have a couple goodies right next to you that we're going to kind of get a closer look at today, aren't we? Uh, yeah. If the angle of the camera was a little bit wider, you would see that I have a lot of stuff. Well, we will. We will. Don't worry. We'll get to you. Let's, uh, let's now go to Alberta, where our good friend, no stranger to CMA, of course, Justin Bond is standing by, who, of course, represents uh, a partnership with Automobility through the firm. How are you doing, Justin? I'm good, man. It's nice to uh, see you. It's very nice to see you. It's very, you know, we've spent so much time talking about uh, high-end product. I mean, we're talking about audiophile. So I'd like yeah. to hear, let's, let's set the stage. You know, what does audiophile mean to you, Justin Bond? I mean, <clears throat> I think when it comes down to the terms of of gear or product or what's going into the car. Um, it really is a combination of, of all aspects, everything of, of everything that you're putting into there. I don't want to say it's just a pair of speakers. I don't want to say it's just a DSP or just an amplifier. I think, uh, you know, the end result is the ability of each one of those critical aspects to perform. Um, whether, you know, I, the, you know, like you said on your your previous uh, live, you know, there's a ton of different definitions for the word audiophile. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I think it's it's the willing to go beyond or or the, or the willing to to kind of go outside of your comfort zone to 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 chase you know this iconic image or this iconic sound that you think you have in your head. And like I said, it's not just the speakers, it's not just the amplifier, it's not just the DSP. So I feel you know with 
with now with automobility and with Audison, um, for me, uh, obviously, you, you, we have a good history uh, in this industry, you and I, but this is the first time that I've actually represented a brand that kind of encompasses that really entire package, right? So, you know, it's, it's really exciting for me. Um, and, you know, I get to work with Phil and I get, you know, it's, I, I consider myself really lucky to be on a, a day-to-day phone call basis with Ken, which is great with support wise, you know, and, uh, and yeah, no, so it's super exciting for me and super fun. And, and I mean, it's, jazzy man it's jazzy and for sure you know you can walk into a, a customer sit down with them and say look here's the here's the lay of the land man like there's a brand, we'll call it audiophile grade gear with like no abandon like there's no, like we're gonna get into it i had a chance to kind of get a preamble with ken so i have a taste of what we're gonna go through today but like that's for me what i've learned from this whole experience talking with all these top you know trainers audiophile is what you want it to be but at the end of the day i feel it's when the um the mission is no longer about let's attain a certain product at a certain budget. Yes. No. Let's attain a product that performs here. This is where we want to be and let's do whatever it takes to get there. Yeah. I mean, at, at, at this point, at, at this kind of critical level, it's like if it makes 0.1% of a difference, do it. Do it. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like, mm-hmm. I don't know. It fascinates me because it's like F1, right? In order for those cars to perform how they do, every single part of that car every single part, like, you know, piece, every single component has to be working 100% optimally optimally to be able to do that. And I think definitely with this brand, uh, that translates into the love of the build, the way that it's designed, the way that it performs, and and ultimately what you get to experience. I don't even want to say here anymore because when you get Mm, with with thesis and it's, it's an experience and, uh, and you know, it's we're all chasing those goosebumps. We're all, ch- you know, and we always talk about the smile on the customer's face. I mean, this is different. It's not a smile, right? It, it's a tear, right? When you get to this level, it's it's like pure emotion. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, it's it's it's, it's exciting. That's all right. I don't know about you guys. I'm ready to geek out. Phil, you ready to geek out? Oh yeah. Justin, all right. Oh, yeah. Let's uh, let's get you guys in the back. We're going to prepare the back studio here and get our uh, our next guest on. Um, when it comes to Audison, I mean, obviously this is the man. He's been on many times, uh, but now I've, I'm, I'm what I'm presenting you today. I've given him the permission to be totally unleashed, unchained, no bars held. We're not skipping over details. We're going to go deep. So if this is the kind of thing that you're interested in, like I am, and like we are. Then buckle up. Here we go. Uh, let's go ahead and bring everybody back in. We've got Justin, we've got Phil, and of course we have Ken Ward, who is the international technical marketing manager for Electro Media. And today we're talking about Audison. Welcome to the show, Ken. Hey Ben, thanks for having me back. And hello, fellows. Hello, fellows, indeed. Uh, Ken, we're we're talking audio files this month here on CMA Networks. Audison, obviously, on the on the menu today. Um, what are we going to cover? How are we going to do this? And what is your intention with today's presentation? Well. I'm going to uh, go back to something that you and, and uh, Justin were talking about. Um, when you're talking about an audiophile as a person, you're talking about a listener who cares more about the result than, than the average person on the street. When we're talking about audiophile as a product category, um, and I, I, I think I said this a little bit earlier this week, as a former product manager, um, I know that the decisions are always um, cost versus benefit for everything that you want to do. Um, If I wanted to add a fuse to a remote starter, I had to prove what the benefit was and if it was going to reduce returns before I would be allowed to put an additional fuse in the kit. When we go to audio, especially with product like we're going to talk about today, which was most of this product was the brainchild of Mr. Vagnoni. Emidio Vagnoni is one of the founders of Audison. Unfortunately, he passed away last year. So Um, The products we come out with over this year and early next year will be the last ones we have with his fingers in the mix. But when you look at Thesis, and also we're going to talk about Voce, because Voce is intended to take the lessons of of Thesis and apply them in a little more accessible position. But when we talk about Thesis, we're talking about starting with a clean sheet of paper. And if you are too limited in how you operate in our business, if you don't own your own 
uh, manufacturing facilities. If you haven't done iteration after iteration of class AB amplifiers in the past, then you really don't have that many things to put on that clean sheet of paper. Uh, when we designed uh, our, our products, and we'll go into this in more detail, we had the experience to know what we wanted to have done in the past. And we also had the capability because of the, the vertical integration that, that we have, that we enjoy. So um, we are going to talk about thesis. And when we start talking about thesis, we'll probably start off with the amplifiers. Then we'll talk about the speakers. Then we'll talk about Voce and what, uh, you know, the old racing improves the breed. I know that Justin brought in F1, so I want to try to take that and run with it a little bit. And so uh, some of the things that we do in thesis are not easily portable, um, but some of the things that we learned in thesis, we would figured out ways to incorporate them in other products uh, moving forward. Um, and then at the end, we're going to talk about uh, processing. We have been in DSP processing for, for quite some time, and we predate DSP processing in the, in the audiophile world. So the offering that we have at that end of the market has a, a couple of things that I think make it special. And then we're going to talk about a source unit. Um, I know that we aren't thought of as a source unit company, and we're not talking about a seven inch screen in the dash here, but we have introduced a wireless link to, that will allow you to run a high resolution from certain devices into yeah. our system and retain some aspects of audiophile performance that some of our customers have told me that they want. And so we'll, we'll be able to go soup to nuts by the, the time we're done. And I, I think you'll like what we have to show you. Well, I think that rounds out very nicely what Justin's point was earlier on, whereas uh, Audison truly is a well-rounded, complete offering. And now you've just added a source to the mix as well. So uh, without further ado, uh, we have a presentation. Let's get that up on the screen and we'll get Ken underway. We're going to stay on here and obviously uh, dialogue with you, Ken, because um, there's going to be some questions that we want some clarity on. Sweet. Well, I, I, let's do it. I love interactivity. All right. So our, our company's... Uh, 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 motto for the Audison brand is an instinct to innovate. Um, Audison is where we put products that are, uh, we believe, advance the state of the art. And um, one thing that I want to show you, and I have to apologize, this slide isn't updated. We actually won some additional awards this year that I haven't added, uh, but uh, organizations like the EISA really do notice the, uh, the, what we put into our products. And we have a very long history of winning an awful lot of awards uh, for these. Um, and when you go into the lobby in the headquarters in Italy, um, these things are all over the place. So um, we're going to start off talking about thesis, which uh, the, the, the line for thesis is beyond the absolute. And the idea there is that if there are absolute limits, we were looking for a way past them uh, when, when we did thesis. And so... Um, the Thesis HV Venti amplifier is the culmination of a series of flagship ampl stereo amplifiers from our company. And the Automotive Audio Press has proclaimed our flagship amplifiers as the amplifier a few times in the past. And that's what we call this. We call this... Um, the, the the amplifier. It is class AB power. It will operate in either a high power mode or a high current mode. Um, it doesn't have any op amps at all. Op amps are silicon packages of just standard uh, transistorized functions. But um, our R&D team didn't want to take the hit that the very small uh, price that they add in background noise and thermal behavior and so they actually did all of the gain stages on the board discreetly. Uh, the amplifier has four power supplies. There's a push and a pull power supply for the left and the right channel. And they're what we call a balanced power supply. Um, we went to great pains to make sure that everything was symmetrical in the power supplies, um, even down to when two traces run past each other that are carrying high current, that they are going in opposite directions so that the induction between them uh, doesn't add cumulatively 
to the non-musical output of the amplifier. When we build these amplifiers, we take the transistors that we've purchased from the transistor manufacturer and we hand sort them first to make sure that they meet our spec. And secondly, we group them so that within the specification range, the left and the right transistors are as closely matched as possible. Um, if you could see this picture on the, the, the I put up here of the amplifier, um, you don't see any transformers on the board. Transformers are inside pretty much every power supply amplifier uh, that you'll ever see. But ours are inside a non-magnetically uh, shielded casing that is filled with resin. And the resin is in there to help make sure that heat from the transformers is evenly dissipated. And it's also to eliminate vibration. Uh, but the, uh, the case is to make sure that the electromagnetic fields from the transformers don't affect each other and don't affect other parts of the circuit board. Um, and when I say circuit board, I should say circuit boards because we have both high and low current uh, circuit boards for separate channels. And the, uh, they also follow a balanced approach so that we, we keep symmetry in the circuit board as much as possible. Now, that is a picture of a build that um, hmm. uh, I, I don't remember where this is from. I think this is from Europe. But you can see that all of that lighting in underneath the glass of, of the thesis is actually incorporated into the amplifier. There are LEDs placed strategically within the amplifier to show you different sections of the amp. And so the entire presentation is designed to let you see what we've done. Because Ken, I need to stop are... you for a second. Yeah, I yeah. need to stop you for a second. First of all, this is like audio gasm happening here, right here. I need, can we just go back a slide real quick? Can yeah. we take a second to appreciate the design and just the aesthetic pr presentation of such a unique piece within the offering of car audio, period? I mean, goodness gracious. I, like when I first saw that, I thought that was a cutaway shot. But now if you now if you go forward to that next slide, that transparent plex, whatever the material that's is. That's how they come out of the, yeah. It's they come out of glass. the box like this. Yes, that's how they come out of their crate. And uh, wow. you know, and that's five of them. That's that's a that, lot. That's Justin's car, pieces. isn't it? Yeah, not that's a hundred yet. KMs, man. <laughs> <laughs> that is a beautiful way to do it. And I I've actually been toying with the idea of um, taking one of these and driving some home audio speakers and letting oh people goodness. hear uh, the the home audio level of performance that we've got here. Um, now. When we go to the rest of the thesis family, because there is a thesis family of amplifiers aside from the HV Venti V amplifier, um, the first thing I want to mention about the, the TH family of thesis amplifiers is while they are all class AB power, they offer networked control. And what that means in this case, and I'll show you a picture in a moment, but in the old days, when you tuned a system, you went around and you tuned the input sensitivity adjustments and you set the crossovers in, in the amplifiers and that was really how we tune systems and these amplifiers were intended to give you the controls for all of the amps in the car in one common location on the pc application and this one actually has four modes there's an energy saving mode which is intended to even be able to play your system while the car is off and then there are high current high power ab class and then a class modes now you might think that the A-class mode is like a corner condition where you won't be playing the amplifier very much in that situation. Um, but we designed all of the TH amplifiers to be able to support A-class operation 100% of the time. The, everything else ramps down from that. These have five power supplies. In addition to the four power supplies for the audio section, there is a fifth power supply that runs the computerized functions in the TH amplifiers. Once again, we use the hand-matched transistors. And once again, we approach the amplifier in a modular design where the low current boards and the high current boards are separated. So we will not have EMF from the, the high current traces spilling over into the low current signal path. Um, this is a screenshot of the, the software in this shot you actually and if you look really closely you can actually see mr vagnoni's name in the the uh via customer name field of this software uh but we've got a, a, a uno a due and a quattro amplifier in the um network 
and we can see the protection state for each of the three amplifiers. We can see the temperature state for each of the three amplifiers. We can define different channel pairs as being a class A or AB or energy saving, which would be like a full B. And uh, you can select the actual input sensitivity, which is not with a, we're used with most amplifiers to having an input potentiometer, which is feels like it's infinitely variable. Um, but with these amplifiers, the input sensitivity is controlled by a resistive ladder. So there are discrete steps that are controlled by a digital potentiometer that we have access to in our software. So these are a really, um, there's nothing like these amplifiers when it comes to networking them together and building a high end system with multiple different chassis. There, there's no other family like it. Now the Uno is actually my favorite of all the TH family amplifiers. It has a couple of features in it that aren't in the Douay and the Quattro. Um, it has a frequency response up to 40K, so it is not a subwoofer amplifier, even though that's how a lot of people end up using it. Uh, you can see that it's high-res certified in the lower corner. In fact, we have added high-res certification to a lot of our pre-existing products. We want customers who are concerned about it to not have to ask the question, not have to have the conversation uh, if uh, how to approach high-res. Uh, we just want people to know if they want to play high-res music, we're going to support them through a, a majority of our gear. Now, if this amp is operating in full class A mode, it's 200 watts into four ohms. And that's a pretty big chassis, but 200 watts of class A is practically unheard of. Um, in home audio, running off 120 volt mains, it's really hard to find a class A amplifier that's 200 watts. Most, most of the time, Ken, they're like 50 times two. 75, yes, maybe? yes, they're, they're 35 to 50. They look like right, the power right. on the front of a, of a, yeah. of a CD player. Um, now, if you step this amplifier into high current mode, you go from 850 watts, you go from 200 to 850, you over quadruple the amount of power into the same four ohm load. Um, it will actually develop 2300 watts into a one ohm load. And if that's just not enough for you, you can strap two together. You can actually have two Unos operate in a bridge strap mode and get 4,500 watts into a one ohm load. Now, uh, that amp has 150 amp fuse on the top. Okay. Um, this amp is rated for 132 amps of max current draw. So regardless of the configuration you're going to use this in, you should never have to upgrade that fuse. You should probably add a battery, though, to the car. You do have to make sure this is one of those products that if you're going to invest in this product, you have to invest in the power delivery to mm -hmm. the, the, the system. Um, this is the kind of product where you start looking at batteries, you start looking at upgraded alternators. I know that's something that I've been engaged in it, uh, my, uh, myself because I have a, a project car where I'm looking at upgrading the alternator. Um, and this is the kind of vehicle that mm -hmm. you are the kind of, of uh, product that you really want to see if you can do that in your vehicle. Um, now, when we go from the Uno to its, um, uh, we're going to go to the, the Douay, the stereo amplifier. This one goes up to 70K. And in class A mode, this is more of what we were used to seeing. It's an 80 by 2 stereo amplifier into 4 ohms. As soon as you drop it into high current mode, it more than triples. We go to 300 watts into that same 4 ohm load. And uh, notice these amplifiers are one ohm capable, which is not that common anymore. Uh, we can do 700 watts by two RMS into that one ohm load, and we can bridge into a two ohm load 1500 watts. Now on this amplifier, it comes with a 100 amp fuse. If you're going to use it in some of the highest current situations, you might need to upgrade that fuse because it can draw 105 amps of current in some of those situations. Same sort of thing also turns out to affect the Quattro. And when we go to the Quattro here, you'll see it also has a 70K high frequency bound. And it's 55 watts by four in class A mode, which is more what uh, we're used to seeing. Mm -hmm. Soon as we drop into high current mode, we go to 160 watts. So we're more than triple. And we can do 340 watts by, two, by four into a one ohm load and we can do 700 by two if we bridge both channels 
into two ohm bridge loads, which is pretty rare. Same thing here. We have a hundred amp fuse. We have a hundred and five amp max current draw in the the most demanding configuration. So you might have to upgrade the fuse in that situation. So those three amplifiers, we've got a four channel, we've got a two channel, we've got a mono, and then we have the HV Venti. That is a family of audiophile amplifiers that most companies don't even approach. But because of how we started, we started making class AP amplifiers and making them better, making them more musical and, and more audiophile. Uh, uh, I think our first amplifiers were so low power that uh, the stuff that we make now is, is startling. Mm. So these have every bit of, uh, of no compromise approach that our company could bring to it. And then um, after we had been in amplifiers for many, many years, uh, we went ahead and decided that we were going to get into speakers in a more committed way. And oh, can, our, can our I just ask you a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to just double check with you and confirm uh, that if you're doing TH amplifiers, uh, should you not want to do full DA or network, you're not going to risk any signal degradation by just using uh, typical RCA interconnects. Thanks for mentioning that because I didn't actually call that out in the slide. Um, we have a technology that applies to our thesis products and it also applies to our, um, our Voce products if you add it as an option. Uh, that we call full DA. Now, full DA can work on the thesis products in two ways. Um, the TH amplifiers have a Toslink digital in, so you can run a Toslink digital in directly into the, these amplifiers, and we have uh, high-res converters that will convert the, the digital signal before amplification. Um, you can also use our proprietary networking technology to bring digital signal in, um, and if you're using it with our Virtuoso, which uh, we have a few slides on later on, uh, you can have a fully digital uh, network. Um, that is a great way to do it. I don't, in the past, I think there have been some explanations that implied that that is the only way that you can do it. And I want to make sure to, to underline that we do accept uh, high quality analog inputs as well as the digital forms. So. Uh, you can build that system any way you like. You can bring Toslink digital in, you can bring uh, digital in from our processor, and you can bring analog in from whatever source that you like. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we will circle around and mention that a little bit more when we get to the to the Virtuoso, but thanks for, thanks for highlighting that because that's an important point. Um, now, when we originally got into speakers, uh, one of the reasons that we got into speakers as a, uh, as a company is that we felt that the speakers that we saw out there, especially the higher fidelity uh, position speakers for car audio were really based on what home audio drivers were doing and what home audio speaker cabinet systems needed and not what we needed in cars. Uh, so that was really the, the fundamental driver for us to get into speakers in the first place. And we have three different drivers right now in the thesis family. We have a, an inch and a half Violino tweeter. We have a three inch Voce mid-range and we have a six and a half inch Saks mid woofer. And I want to talk about each of these in turn and talk about what they do differently. And let's see if I got these slides in the right order here. Um, dee -dee -dee. All of our speakers are built at our speaker manufacturing facility, La Voce Italiana. Now, La Voce Italiana happens to be in China. Um, we're really fortunate that the Chinese government uh, had no problem with us taking over 100% ownership of our speaker manufacturer. We started off with a partner, and our partner decided they wanted to go into uh, cell phone speakers um, more exclusively. And so what we do here is we build pro audio drivers for a number of customers, some of whom you've heard of, we just earned a large contract with Dolby, who is redoing a lot of cinema uh, audio systems using our drivers. Um, but for car audio, we only build our own brands. We don't build for uh, any other brands, even though some of them have approached us. We focus on Audison and our other uh, speaker brands uh, here. So All of these products were made 100% with parts that were designed for this project. 
even the screws, e even the screws were uh, something that we specified uh, very, very uh, precisely. Um, we also have uh, that let us select the tolerances. A lot of times if you're playing Build-A-Bear and you're picking a voice coil former from this supplier and a magnet from this supplier, then you don't have that much control over the intolerances of your product. And we didn't have that challenge. A lot of the metal parts here are a, a CNC machine to meet our, our design. And you'll see the, the design that this makes available to us because Audison really does commit to the idea that if we have something that sounds beautiful, it should look beautiful. And that if we want to tell you this product is, is a worthy uh, uh, product for you to consider, that it should appeal to you in levels other than just me talking. You should be able to get the essence of the product when you, when you look at it. Well, so, I think we, I don't know if we want to do this now, Ken, or later, but I, I, I can't help but see that uh, I think Phil actually has this tweeter ready to show. Oh, yeah, that would be great. That would be a lot let's, better. Let's get that. a zoom in on Phil there, and well, maybe you can talk to us through um, describing. I know you're about to describe the tweeter right now. Yeah, so you can see, I know Phil has really big hands, but that's still a really big tweeter. And uh, uh, It is a big go. tweeter, yeah. Uh, and if you show the depth on it, Phil, um, you can see that it has a lot of depth. It's not something that's going to fit into a factory snap-in location, but there are some reasons that we built it at the size that we did. And one of the things that that, that depth that you see on that tweeter, there is actually a chamber that you'll see a picture of in a moment that has air behind the uh, the dome. It's like a subwoofer enclosure for a tweeter, and you can see it. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but it's down here at the bottom. Um, and that helps tune the performance of the entire speaker system uh, to allow it to play significantly lower. Um, the magnet that's in here is a N38 H grade magnet of neodymium that provides 1.67 Tesla meters of force. I didn't know what that meant, so I had to look it up. Um, the first thing is, is that that's about as much force as a standard six and a half inch woofer magnet. Mm. And it's also about the same amount of force that a, a average magnetic resonance imaging system at the hospital develops. Now, that magnet is 60 millimeters in diameter and it's five millimeters tall, almost a quarter inch. And the reason that we use such a large magnet was because we were wanting to avoid using an inductance shorting ring or a Faraday ring in our tweeter because the Faraday ring does give you some benefits, but it also ha adds a couple of challenges. And we have a six ohm tweeter here that we didn't want to, we, we just wanted to get the, the same result with a lot of magnetic strength in the gap. And so that's what we did. The, do the dome is 38 millimeters. It is completely silk. And the shape of the dome was designed with finite element analysis on our computer systems. We started with 33 different profiles. We went through a lot of simulated testing. We identified three different profiles that we actually manufactured. And then we tested them against each other before we arrived at this design. The 38 millimeter dome has a 34 millimeter voice coil on it. And the voice coil wire is aluminum for lightweight with a copper cladding. And when we use that for amplifier power, we know that that runs a gauge smaller. So a lot of people don't like to use it for amplifier power. But for voice coils, it's a great way to reduce your mass and still get the benefits of copper. So that chamber down below gives us a, a resonant frequency, which is actually just below 800 hertz when we're using the chamber. And you don't have to actually use the chamber. You can actually use a, a disc on the back to shorten the the tweeter if that's what you need in the installation that you're performing. Now, this tweeter actually plays to 30K. I think it's within 3dB to 26K. And the way we were able to accomplish that was all about how we fasten the voice coil to the dome. Uh, those are usually glued together. They're glued together for us. We had to use special glue we had to build robots that actually would perform this. We have 20 different jigs during the tweeter assembly process to make sure that everything goes together properly so that we can hit the performance specs that we need to at the end. 
So this tweeter is just an insane level of assembly precision to get what we're talking about. Now, let's see right here, you can see the result of the chamber. The black line is the resonant peak for this tweeter when you have the full case on the back and the full air chamber on the back. And you can see it's just below 800 hertz. You can also see it's fairly well damped. But when you step to the blue line, that's when you don't use the full depth and you put the disc on the back that shortens up the, the, the size of the chamber and it moves the resonant frequency up to about a thousand, maybe a hair higher. And you can see it's not quite as well damped because the peak is higher here. But that's a really important option to give our dealers because if the card, we talked about there not being compromises. And when we talk about that, we're talking about not making compromises in the cost of the design, the cost of the assembly. But it's at the end of the day, we still have to fit it in a car. So one of the things we did was give the dealer some options for physically fitting it in the car. Now, what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to show you the performance at the top end. And you can see on these charts, there is performance, the, the performance at the top end of the tweeter is the same. Um, but those dotted lines are for progressively off-axis measurements. And what you can see with this tweeter is that you can get out to 20K without even having it on axis. A lot of our dealers, when they install this tweeter, they do go the extra mile. They do build a beautiful fabrication, uh, uh, whether it's in an A-pillar or a sail trim. They will often go to the point where they can build this tweeter on axis. And obviously, we'll get performance above 20K in that application. But if you're putting this in a car where you can't put it on axis, uh, maybe it's a collector's car, maybe it's a rare vehicle that the customer doesn't want to have a visible modification. If you have to put this behind a factory grill where it's not on axis, we still will get you out to 20K. And that is a really important element behind using a thesis tweeter. And for a 1.5 inch dome to get you that high is basically unheard of. Um, at, the, at the low end, we can cross this tweeter in as low as uh, 1500 hertz. And so uh, I know that we make a three-way, uh, 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 sorry, we make the drivers to support a three-way kit and you can order the orchestra three-way kit. We'll show you that in a bit. But what if you have a car that just supports a six and a half and a tweeter, which is still the most commonly supported uh, speaker kit in, in the industry? Um, we allow you to bring in this tweeter at 1500 Hertz and that takes a big load off the six and a half because six and a halves in the bottom of a door really struggle in an off axis position to play beyond 2K. So I'm going to show you uh, a chart that, that helps uh, explain that when we go over uh, the six and a half. So it's a 38 millimeter voice coil. It's around 92, 93 dB efficient, depending on whether you use the plate on the back or not. Um, it is a six ohm tweeter, so it's good that you use a, a powerful amplifier with it. Um, and now we're gonna talk about the, the the three inch mid range. I don't remember if you have the three inch mid range there or not, Phil. Oh yes, I do. Well, hey, I couldn't resist stop. unboxing it. <laughs> ah, okay. Phil has well, been thirsting over these products for the last 24 hours. Once he pulled it out of inventory. <laughs> well, well what? the unboxing, is is amazing let's take a look at that let's let's go to phil this is worth it i i, I, I myself have never seen a box of these of these speakers so let's go to phil here gosh i feel like there should be a soundtrack right <laughs> godfather yeah, maybe it's... something italian themed all right it, it feels like when box. you open the box it oh look be... at that there's oh. a latch to it oh my oh, yeah. my all right Ooh. Now, you can see there, we have a beautiful set of bar grills in the kit. Um, as Justin and I were talking about before the show, we also have a more modern looking set of mesh grills that are available. They are a very low production quantity metal grill that you can see on the website for these. Um, oh. But that is the three inch mid range. And as you can see, the, the cone for the mid range is transparent. And the cone for the six and a half is transparent. Uh, they're made from a material called TPX that I'll talk more about in a moment. Now, see how small the back end of that of that mid range is. 
Uh, that's because we use the neodymium magnet. I'll talk about that in a moment. That's inside the voice coil for the, the, the mid range. There's a vent on the back to help keep it cool. But, uh, and, and also the, the whole frame, which is beautiful. I, I just love the, the industrial design behind the frame that we use for these, but it also acts as a heat sink and ducks heat away from the voice coil. Phil, could you bring that closer to the lens? I'm being greedy here. I really want to see details. It, yes, it looks like it looks like a tiny subwoofer, really. If you don't don't see what's going on there, it actually says thesis, right? Oh, there it is. Now I see it. Yeah, interesting. Actually, one thing that's really unique is Phil. Can you flip it over to the back and just hold it up a little closer? If you guys notice on the right hand side, there's a QR code, right? And that is Audison's EID program. Ken, could you potentially speak to that? It's actually quite unique. So you can scan that and you can actually, tr we can actually track the, the, where the speaker was sold, where it was shipped, uh, the production date, um, everything that has to do in our system with that individual driver uh, is on record. And so that Ooh. is something that you can use when you register your warranty. And uh, I, I believe that uh, automobility will extend your warranty when you register your speaker using that information. Now, is that exclusive to only a thesis line, Justin? Uh, no, I believe it's in the other lines as well. Oh, we do it in an awful lot of our lines. I don't think we do it in every single line, but we do Not it in yet. a lot of our, our high value products. And it's definitely throughout the, all the thesis products we will talk about today and the Voce products we'll talk very, about. Very, very nice. That was definitely worth it. Thank you, Phil. So let's Hey, see. that's what I'm here, right? Show <laughs> product, make it look good. You don't have to try very hard. Those are pretty outstanding right there. Yeah, I think I'm going to keep those. I'm sure you are. Yeah, right. <laughs> so here's an exploded view of that mid-range. I just love these exploded views that, that uh, Audison makes available. And you can see in the middle, you can see the voice coil and the voice coil winding for that 3-inch. It's a bigger voice coil than most 3-inch speakers have. And the magnet exists inside it. And just above the magnet in that exploded view, you can see a bright silver colored ring. That is an aluminum uh, uh, Faraday uh, shorting ring to reduce the intermodulation distortion, to reduce the distortion of the speaker at high, the high frequencies. And that's something that we couldn't have done with the magnet without making the speaker not fit in its intended destination. So we did use in, uh, uh, inductance management rings in the three inch. Um, it once again uses the same uh, high grade of neodymium. Uh, we've got the vent in the back to cool it down. And uh, it, once again, it's got the same alloy frame. Now, this is the high, this is the frequency response for this three inch mid range. Now, if you look at it, you'll notice it plays lower than you would normally expect a three inch mid range to play. Uh, the resonant frequency is around 100 hertz and we want you to cross it over above that. Um, but you'll notice that the various different dotted lines that show you the frequency response and different off axis angles all cluster very, very close together until you get to around 5K. So when you're talking about the pass band of this mid-range and by the way it's obviously designed to be a mid-range it's not intended to be a wideband speaker you could put it in a pod and name it at you and probably get the top end boosted on an eq if you wanted to use it as a wideband but it's really intended as a mid-range to mate with that alongside that that violino uh, tweeter but it doesn't matter which way you aim this speaker up to around 5k the frequency response is going to be almost indistinguishable and you can see how linear the passband of that mid-range is. Now, we do have uh, parts of the world and we do have dealers out there that really like to put mid-ranges at this price point into pods off the A-pillar. I'm not a big fan of pods off the A-pillar myself, but this driver was designed to work in very small enclosures so that unlike some of those speakers that you put in, a, in an A-pillar enclosure, you won't be distorting the low frequency performance by putting it in a small enclosure. That's part of the design for the speaker. Now, it's 110 watts peak, 55 watts continuous power. It's a much less efficient driver 
than the uh, the 1.5 inch tweeter. It's 86 dB SPL and it's a four ohm driver. Um, and so now we get to talk about the six and a half. And I think you've got the six and a half there as well, right, Phil? Oh, yes, I do. Come well, on, Vanna. Excuse me while Phil takes out the six and a half and uh, shows us what that driver looks like. Once again, you can see the transparent TPX. That's a signature of the, the Voce drivers. Uh, TPX is a proprietary uh, uh, thermopolymer that is made in Japan. It is incredibly resistant to both heat from melting and heat from lo for losing rigidity. A lot of plastics will get soft in the higher temperatures found in a car and will deform. And TPX is a proprietary material that's only available from one m supplier in Japan, and that's what we use to make these cones. I want to make a point of saying how unique that is. Um, this is the first time I've ever heard of this material. It makes it very unique. You know, we're used to um, some rendition of paper type material that's been mixed with some type of, you know, resin or fiberglass or something of that nature. Or, you know, you've heard of Kevlar. This is very unique. And uh, I did a little bit of research, thanks to you, Ken. And uh, yeah, it's got some really unique properties um, that I can see why Audison. Uh, a, it looks super cool. Let's just get that out of the way. But the fact of the heat resistance, that is very, very interesting. I think that's it, the kind of stuff that makes it, you know, unique. I, in researching it myself, I learned that it's very resistant to various chemicals, including gasoline, which is not a mm -hmm. bad thing to have in an automotive environment, even though a few people spill gasoline on their door panels. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very resistant to water. It won't change its behavior when it has some water on it. And also... It, UV it mo should not should not change color either. Correct. Which is interesting. Mm -hmm. And it is so resistant to temperature that a lot of medical grade test equipment and lab equipment is made with TPX. Um, and that's uh, that's something that I didn't appreciate um, until I was researching for for this. Um, now, let's see here. This is the speaker that I think embodies this principle the most, but it's really something that affects all three of the drivers in the thesis line. Uh, the company didn't want there to be compression when music gets loud. They didn't want it to happen at the upper end of the output of the speaker. They didn't want it to happen when the speaker got warm. There's a principle called thermal compression, which means when your voice coil gets warm because you've been playing it for a while, suddenly the resistance changes and the impedance changes, and the speaker doesn't get as loud as it did before. And that's something that we really wanted to avoid any kind of compression, including thermal compression. And so when we go through and look at the exploded view of this speaker, you'll see it's a two inch voice coil. We tested larger voice coils and we decided that we didn't want to go with the larger voice coil. A two inch voice coil would give us the power handling that we wanted without the penalty of too much moving mass. Now, the, the neodymium magnet is around the outside of the two inch voice coil. And there is a uh, aluminum uh, ring in there to control the inductance of the six and a half inch motor as well. Now look at the spider. This is something that I really didn't give sufficient uh, uh, credence to or sufficient attention to in the past, I should say. Um, a lot of high end speakers have a very narrow uh, uh, spider. Uh, the distance between the inner opening and the outer opening is very, very minimal. And what that does is it creates some uh, uh, additional uh, 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 stress. Uh, uh, basically, spiders are terrible for adding distortion to speakers. And uh, what we did to control this spider, we use two different fabric textiles that are woven together. And I'll show you a, a diagram of this in a moment. But fundamentally, the biggest thing that we did was we um, made sure that there were five complete uh, uh, wave cycles in the shape of the spider. So that um, we also changed how we mat mount the spider to the voice coil and how we mount the spider to the frame to make sure that those are symmetrical when the speaker is moving up and when the speaker is moving down so that we have a symmetrical compliance in either direction. 
Um, and I don't know, I had a video in here, but I may not have translated it properly for this, this uh, system that we're using here. So let's see what it looks like. Um, you can see the edge of this cone. You can see that the, the dust cap and the cone are really one piece, even though they change color here. Um, they are one piece. And what that means is that we were able to take the breakup modes that usually happen with a dust cap that's glued on top, and we were able to push them out of the pass band of the speaker. I'll show you a graph in a moment that shows you how we were able to get better performance out of the pass band of the six and a half from how we designed the cone. The cross section of the cone, which you can see in the lower left picture, it actually isn't a single sheet with a mm. constant thickness. There is actually separate curves to the, the upper and lower edges to increase rigidity and to make sure that it holds its position at the extremes of travel uh, within the the spider and surround framework. I, I, I want to talk about this for a second, Ken. So this is something that I have not come across yet. We've spent lots of time talking about cone materials, cone design, flexibility, lightness, all that type of stuff. This is something very interesting. It's a great talking point. They've taken the time to apply certain thicknesses at certain points within the cone design depending on the demand of the stress that it would take at that spe specific spot. That is next level. Yeah, and that's something that's definitely beyond what most uh, speaker cones uh, get. You know, most speaker cones come off of, of, uh, of uh, fixed. Like how do you do that with paper? You can't do that with paper. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, it, there's a lot. The way this cone is manufactured is unlike the way most cones mm -hmm. get built. That's, that's absolutely correct. Um, and when you look it up, it turns out TPX is the lightest of any thermoplastic polymer that you can get. Of course. And right. so that's how we were able to get the, the low moving mass for the assembly. But it also has excellent temperature properties like we talked about before. Mm -hmm. It's not going to change its performance you know, when the car gets hot. Now, I think what we're going to see here is a diagram of the... Um, the surround and the spider together. And what you can see here is that the we did a lot of different profile designs for the spider. And then I mentioned before that we use two different types of fabric that are woven together to get the compliance we wanted out mm -hmm. of the spider. And the five waves that you can see in the, the middle there, that's a really important point that R&D really wants to make sure that we mention because they found a big payoff from having that many undulations in the spider shape instead of having a really, really narrow racetrack around the edge of a big voice coil. They found that this was a much more linear way to get performance out of the speaker. Um, that really long term at the bottom, isobutylene, isoprene, um, that is just the type wow. of natural butyl rubber that we use on the the surround. Um, uh, IIR, I think, is what it's often called. I'm uh, applauding but, your perfect uh, diction of that word. Very well done. Well, <laughs> it's better to be lucky than good. Um, and I think what we've got uh, here, let's see here. Um, this is the frequency response for the six and a half. Now, you can see that it plays well below 100 hertz, and, and I think we've talked about in shows in the past, uh, a, a six and a half that's designed to work with a quality subwoofer doesn't need to play that far below 80 hertz. There's not a whole lot of benefit there, but this speaker does have good low frequency performance, but look how linear it is all the way up to 2K. If you go all the way up to 2K, it makes very little difference in the frequency response whether you put this speaker in a the bottom of a door on the driver's side, a bottom of a door on the passenger side, or pointed at you, you're not going to see a big difference in frequency response. And that is something that our engineers spent quite a bit of time on to, to be able to deliver. So if you have a tweeter, uh, if you pair this with our 1.5 Violino tweeter, and you cross that in at 1500 hertz or 2000 hertz, you've got the ability, I usually use 1500 hertz whenever I can, you've got a really linear response all the way out past 20K. In a two-way setup. In a two-way setup. Well, so, okay, I, I'm, I'm being loudmouthed here, but I, I this is a point I want to... Uh, okay, based on what I see here, 
And based on what you said about off-axis, I mean, the the delta in, in performance difference from what I see in this graph can it like the act the off-axis performance. You know, I, I see posts on social media about thesis installs, and a lot of the times, you know, they're going into some pretty snazzy cars, right? You know, I've seen uh, just this morning, I seen one on a Lamborghini, right? This is a fantastic option for that high-end customer that wants that premium feel, look, sound, and you don't have to go nuts necessarily on the physical position slash fabrication required to get that on axis performance. Justin, do you, do you feel what I'm trying to say here? Oh yeah. You know what I no, mean? I like it's, it, it comes down. So it, it comes down to, to placement and flexibility and the, and, and the mechanics of the speaker by itself being able to deliver what it has. Like, like Ken said, when, when we talk about no compromise, um, that's great for the manufacturing process. That's great for, for us building the speaker. But at the end of the day, in the car, there is a compromise. And if we can avoid having to put a speaker in front of your field of view that your face is going to smack off if you get into a collision, and we can still uh, you know, get the results that are desired and still have the ability to perform um, regardless of you know, our axis or off-axis symmetry, then I think that kind of just speaks to the whole kind of no compromise and why everything in thesis is purpose built, right? So it's uh, it's fascinating. It's right? just usually when we're dealing at this, we're talking about such like, I'm used to hearing, oh, it's great, it's high end, it's perfect, everything, but you need to be like this and like this and like this and like this to optimize yeah, no, the performance. No buts here. It's refreshing to hear that they thought of this in a real world situation where yeah, let's be honest. That driver is going to be next to your knee, man. Like that's just the way it is. And and we've got a lot of exotic vehicles that don't support a three-way, and mm. the customer of that exotic vehicle may not want to modify mm -hmm. or, or or change the interior to accommodate a three-way. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 last time I heard these speakers, and it's actually the first time I got to tune a system with these speakers, was in a Ferrari Roma where there was just the two-way set and i was blown away by the frequency response in non-optimal locations for the tweeter but also those speakers would just get loud when they needed to get loud without any strain and that's something that those of us who have been in this industry for a while we've all heard speakers when they get to the limit where we know ooh, that doesn't mm -hmm. sound like we should go any higher unfortunately mm -hmm. many of our customers don't notice that um, but with musical peaks, these speakers just do not add anything to the music that shouldn't be there because of the way that they're designed. I see in the chat that someone was asking about cold, and this is actually one of the benefits of Audison being an international company. Um, one of the big, uh, historically, one of the big international customers has been uh, Russia and the Ukraine, and it gets really cold in Russia too. And so we make sure that those cones are going to maintain their integrity in ridiculously cold temperatures. I will say that most of the time in ridiculously cold temperatures, you will have a little bit of stiffness in your sur surround in your spider, and you probably will have different sound when the system warms up than when it is essentially frozen solid. But that's physics, Ken. Yeah, we can't, I can't not push kind of any hotter every cotton. brand. Yeah, um, but yes, we we do have an eye toward cold because we have a lot of international customers mm -hmm. in the 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 northern uh, latitude. So, uh, great question, and yeah, uh, we won't leave you hanging on that one. Thank you, Joe Johnston. Now, along with that, um, we've got the basket for the six and a half. The main thing I wanted to show with this picture is just to show that even though this is not the most shallow six and a half around, we've all seen deeper six and a halves. Uh, the magnet diameter on the back is fairly limited because of the neodymium approach. And so we took pains to design a six and a half that could actually be installed in a car. Imagine. That's why we use the neodymium magnet. That's why we use the, the, the voice coil arrangement that we did. So you may have to do some extra work to get that six and a half into some cars. Uh, but we're all used to that. You know, that's something that, that especially Audison dealers... Um, we tend to be um, more experienced and more confident that, um, but hey, well, let's face it. I've put fender washers on a window regulator for a speaker that wasn't nearly as good as this. Uh, so, you know, we, 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 as an industry, we have ways of overcoming that sort of thing. Um, 
So here we are, 300 watts peak, 150 watts continuous, around 87 dB of SPL, and uh, it's rated up to 4,500 hertz on axis. It doesn't play quite that high off axis, and you don't need it to. Um, and of course, the ultimate way to put that together is going to be in a, uh, a three-way kit, which I'll show you in a moment. But first, uh, I remember when we were showing uh, Ben some of what we were going to talk about, and he saw this, and I don't think you thought this was a passive crossover. Honestly, first, I thought we went to this new DSP that I've never seen before for a second. <laughs> yeah. So this is the, <laughs> the passive crossover. Um, by the way, I should mention that all of these thesis drivers are our second generation of thesis drivers. Mm -hmm. And this is the second generation of the thesis crossover. And if you look around the edges, you can see all those red uh, mm -hmm. devices. Those are mm -hmm. inductors. And uh, there might be a red capacitor out there, but I think they're all inductors. And we kept them pretty far away from each other. If you think about how most passive crossovers, and this is a two-channel passive crossover. So if you think about the way most two-channel passive crossovers work when you put them together, you've got inductors right up against each other. And that means that their magnetic fields are affecting each other. That reduces your stereo separation, and it actually changes the value of the inductor. So it actually screws up your crossover. So you can see here that we've kept our left and our right inductors very far away from each other. And also, if when you look at this picture up close, we actually have brass heat sink resistors in four rows down the center of the board with cooling bars to get heat off of the, the resistors bolted to the top of them. And the reason for that is this is one of the rare crossovers that actually has a mid frequency control. When some people use these passives, they're, some of the times they're using them for, for customers who are not DSP fans. And so we actually have tuning built into this passive crossover, along with the ability to buy amplify that most passive crossovers don't have. And of course, the, the level of parts that was used were just insane in terms of a lot of those parts were made specifically for us. Re real quick, real quick, and I know you're about to show the active set. So is this a series, an a la carte series? Do I have to order the passive crossovers separately? Now, that's an interesting question. Um, we, you can order it a la carte. We do offer an active system, which actually won best loudspeaker when it was introduced at the EISA. Um, and that's the six and the tweeter and no passive crossover. Um, those grills are included. And then we offer it as wow. a two way passive. And then we offer it also as a three way active. We do not make a three way passive. Don't ask. Um, we, we think that there are enough amplifiers out there now with multiple channels. If somebody wants to do this, uh, we think they're going to use a quattro yeah, and a duet, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So that is the speakers. And did before we go into the Voce line, did you have any questions about the thesis product that we've been talking about, Ben? Uh, I mean, I think we covered it. You know, I'm still blown away by that first amplifier. That's got to be, you know, some of the sexiest gear period in the industry. Um, just from a design step. I, I like I always said, kids, like I compare things to guitars. What's a great guitar? One that inspires you to pick it up. That amplifier inspires you to make the time to enjoy your music wherever it is. You know what I mean? You just want to hear it. It looks, it sounds great sitting still. You know what I mean? Um, so kudos for obviously for that. But I mean, I look, I think we covered a lot deeper than we ever have when it comes to the thesis line of speakers in particular. Um, I think that cone material is something certainly that uh, is going to come up in some conversations after this presentation. Yeah, um, I mentioned that I had the chance to tune a Ferrari Roma that had these speakers in it. Um, it was actually at a dealer's uh, open house, and I stayed and actually demonstrated the system to a lot of his open house attendees for the next hour and a half or so. And uh, Demoing a thesis speaker system is a lot like walking through a grocery store with a bouquet of flowers. Everybody's happy for you. Mm. Like it's just it, it's hard to be in a bad mood after that because everybody is so happy that you're letting them hear this this audio system. It, it was just an amazing response I got from every single person who auditioned it. Um, nice. Now, when we talk about Voce as a product line, uh, it really was intended to take some of the lessons that we learned with thesis and put it into a slightly more accessible package that a few more people could get. And so we have amps and speakers here, and I'm gonna just, if it's okay, I'm gonna spend a minute talking about these mm -hmm. and draw some parallels. Now, on the amplifiers, uh, the 
entire family of amplifiers that are four. Um, they are all class AB power. There's one exception I'll mention in a minute. They use a regulated pulse width modulated power supply. Now, when I say regulated, what I mean is, is that within certain voltage ranges, you're going to get rated power. And below that voltage range, you will still be close to rated power until you drop so low that the amplifier is not going to continue to operate and it's going to shut down in a low voltage protection state. Most amplifiers tie their output directly to their input voltage and the input voltage goes up and down, the output will change. Now that in older cars, and we're, we're used to this because we've been around this a long time. Uh, the way it used to work is you accelerate and the voltage goes up. So if we just uh, up the alternator, increase the batteries, we can upgrade our charging system, everything will be fine. Modern alternators work in reverse. They're computer controlled. And when you accelerate, the alternator shuts off to reduce parasitic drag. When you decelerate, when you take your foot off the gas, the alternator will start to charge the battery. If you step on the brake, the alternator will kick up and charge the battery more. And so it's really the opposite of what we expect from a charging system. So regulated amplifiers are something that we've had in our line for quite a while. And we see a resurgence in customers and dealers interest in amplifiers that don't quite so stiffly tie the output power to the input voltage. So that said, you can see there's a similarity in the shape of the Voce amplifier compared to the Thesis TH. The heatsink industrial design is modeled on the Thesis. I didn't mention this, but the Thesis is a combination of convection cooling and fan cooling. There's actually slots on the sides. And this one also has a computer controlled fan and a, a management processor called AMP, uh, which is a microcontroller that manages all the protection circuitry and the cooling system. The, the DNA trickle down is undeniable. Yeah, it, it is a family, right? Mm -hmm. Now we have gone back and certified these for high res. And the first amp I'm gonna talk about is the flagship of the Voce line, the 5.1K. And the 5.1K is an amplifier that has two 75 watt class A biased channels. And what that means is for the first 30 watts or so, these channels are pure class A. And if you're using them on tweeters, um, and I should back up, the difference between class A and class B is that with class A, the transistors are on 100% of the time, whether they're getting signal or not. And with class B, the transistor that is not getting signal, when the positive half of the waveform is being played, the negative transistor shuts off. And there's this thing called crossover notch distortion, which is not related to crossover filter at all, um, where you hear a little, there's just a tiny little measurable background mm -hmm. when one transistor is turning on and the other transistor is turning off. And one of the ways we can manage that is finally adjusting the turn on and turn off voltages so that everything is as smooth as possible. But audiophiles have recognized for some time that class A is the purest sound, especially through a tweeter. Now, if you're playing it through a six and a half in a car and you start the car and you drive the car and you have the background noise from driving the car, that sound is not gonna be as audible as it would be with a tweeter when you're listening to it in a critical audition. But in this amplification system, we've got class A bias channels, two 75 watt channels, four tweeters primarily. You can use them for rear speakers and you can use them for mid ranges and tweeters at the same time. But in, it's, we really thought that it's mostly used for tweeters. The next two channels are dedicated class AB. So at low, low levels, they're class A, but as soon as you start to run any power through them, they switch to class B and they will give you 140 watts per channel. That's perfect for mid bass. And then we have a class D sub channel that is 600 watts into four ohms and a thousand watts into two ohms of RMS power. Now, those numbers are at 14.4 volts, but if you mm -hmm. drop the power down to 12 volts, you still get 50 watts on the tweeters, 120 watts on the mid base, and 500 watts to the forum sub. So we've maintained a really consistent power be, uh, envelope, whether the car is running or not. There's three types of amplifications within the same chassis. Yes, and this is an unheard of, we were the first ones to do this, and even the amplifiers yep. that I've seen come along afterward generally run uh, the one and two channels and three and four channels with exactly the same 
architecture. Mm -hmm. We actually have this amplifier design. We know that when you're using a tweeter, you don't need 140 watts for a tweeter mm -hmm. systems. So this works out really, really well with either a set of thesis, fix and tweeter, and a, then a sub. So or, in layman's terms, Ken, the engineers here have optimized the type of amplification for the purpose within this five channel system. Right, the, the knock on class D from audio files was always that the highs were not as good as everything right. else. But for a, a sub channel, class D is a Perfect. great way to deliver a mm -hmm. lot of sub power. A lot of power. And, and so th this amplifier has been one of our, our mainstays. It has really been popular. Um, in the last few years, it hasn't been as popular as it used to be, partly because some people don't know about it, um, and partly because people have started to go to fully active three-way front stage systems, mm. um, so, uh, which is nice. Um, but we do want to let people know that the 5.1K is available, and it's available in two forms. It's available in an in HD version that only has digital in, but it is still available in an RCA input version. And that's actually my favorite because you can fit it into an awful lot of systems. So the uh, the next amplifier in the family, we have the same three names we used in Thesis, which makes a lot of sense if you know Italian because this is four, two, and one. Um, it might seem a little confusing that the Thesis amps have the same name as the Voce amps, but that that's it, the name is the number of channels. So it's really, is pretty simple when you think about it that way. Um, the Uno is a really cool amplifier. Once again, it is a Class A monoblock. It has a feature in it that isn't in the other two called Power On Demand. And this is kind of, um, it has a little bit of a Class H element to it where the power supply will react based on the signal coming in. And so the amplifier will not be pulling full current at all times it'll pull current when it needs it based on the demands of the input signal. It also has a function in it uh, called that we call a distortion limiter uh, when you're using it in a dual mono full range application. If you're using it in a sub application, you're not, not gonna be needing the distortion limiter for the same reason. It is a regulated power supply. And in this particular instance, this amplifier will deliver the same amount of power at 12 volt of, of battery power that it will at 14.4. 700 watts into a 4 ohm load, 1300 watts into a 2 ohm load, and 1700 watts into a 1 ohm load. Um, and I should mention that this amp is designed to be able to deal with complex impedances that momentarily drop as low as 0.5 ohms. And one of the reasons for that is, especially before a lot of dealers were comfortable with DSP, a lot of uh, flagship audiophile systems were running on completely passive networks. Uh, some speaker companies still have very complex passive networks for their flagship speakers. And those passive networks present really complex impedance loads at various frequencies. So this amplifier was designed to be able to handle um, momentary uh, impedances as low as half an ohm. And I don't know if you, does anybody have one of these over there in, uh, in, um, on your side, folks? I forgot to ask. Yeah, I do. If you want to see, I got the 5.1 here. Oh. All right. Well, let's yes, check yes, it yes, out. Please. All right. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so they're All not right. the smallest amp. You know, they're not the smallest amp. I don't think underneath the seat of my Civic is, the, is really the right home for it. By the way, you can see that the fuse, just like in the thesis, is available on the top. So you don't have to pull the amp to get to it. Um, the controls are also on the top. Now, if you could rotate it a 90 degrees to show the edge, you can see that it's not a very tall amplifier. You know, it's, it's fairly easy to fit under a false floor. It's fairly easy to fit in some tight spots as long as you have the footprint for it. And you can see those shiny uh, cap screws on the, the ends are what hold the output transistors to the heat sink. Um, all the power comes in on the same side there and then I think you've got the signal on the other side. So we keep signal and power separated. And that is a 5.1K, isn't it? Yes, it is. And it's yeah. not a light amplifier. Lift, lift with your legs, Phil. Lift with your legs. <laughs> so this is, this is one of the, the, the amplifiers that has been incredible. It's, it's it won one of our awards for sure. And it is uh, 
a lot of people really like this amp to this day. Um, it, it does require you because it does have a lot of class A, B channels in it. You, you're going to need to make sure you have enough power and you're going to need to make sure that you have enough room. But uh, I've seen this on the back wall of Toyota trucks, you know, behind mm -hmm. the seat. Well, so. again, this is intended for a single amp setup. So, I mean, yeah, it has been priced, but it's your only car. chassis that you're going to need. Yeah. All right. Thank so, you, Phil. Yeah, thanks, Phil. So now, there it's he like is. There's Phil. Stuff, right? So now we'll go to the Due stereo amplifier, and this amp can actually be bridged mono, or it can be run in tri-mode, which is something I haven't done in quite a few years, but it is technically possible. Uh, I didn't ask if you could run 14 speakers off of it, but uh, <laughs> it's got the pulse width modulated power supply. Four ohm rating is 260 by two, which is quite a bit of power. It only drops to 210 at 12 volts. At two ohms, it goes up to 450 by two, which means that you can bridge it into a four ohm load and get 900 watts. So that's a very powerful class AB amplifier. Yeah. And then when we get into the Quattro, we're going to see, once again, same footprint. Um, it is bridgeable. You actually have uh, people, this, this amp actually was intended to be able to run a sub off the back half and your front stage off the front half in a single amp system. It's 120 by four. It only drops to 100 watts at 12 volts, and it goes up to 200 by four at, at two ohms. So you can actually do 120 by two on your front stage and 400 watts to your subwoofer if you're using this amp to run your entire system. So that's the AV family of amplifiers. And you can see there's a lot of technology in them, and a good bit of it is technology that we, we based on our, our uh, thesis amplifiers. But I want to spend a minute to talk about the Voce audiophile speakers. Um, we have a cast frame six and a half. We have a cast frame tweeter. There's a cast frame three that isn't in this picture. And then we have a set of coaxes. And one of the things that I want to talk about on these speakers, um, oh, I went too far. The, we talked about the tweeter in uh, thesis being an inch and a half across and being able to play all the way down to 1500 Hertz. Now the tweeter in Voce is a 1.1 inch tweeter, or 28 millimeter tweeter. It's not nearly as large as the one in thesis and it will fit in a number of factory locations, but it has a resonant frequency around a thousand Hertz, which allows you to use a 2000 Hertz active high pass crossover, even on the Voce tweeter. And the passive that it comes with, if you get the passive kit, it is available a la carte or in a two-way kit. If you go with the two-way kit, that that uh, that tweeter is crossed over at 2,500 hertz in a, a passive mode. Now, our two-way kits tend to have a crossover an octave or more below the competition. So if you were to listen to this six and tweeter kit, in a display board where the six and a half is pointed at you, you're not going to hear the difference because that six and a half does a lot better job of playing the upper region when it's pointed at you. But if you take the speaker and rotate the six and a half and put it in a car door, suddenly that the tweeter playing down to 2500 is going to give you a lot more warmth. It's going to give you a lot more presence in the mid range vocals and the guitar because otherwise those sounds get lost coming out of the six and a half. And that's something that our, uh, many of our competitors don't uh, take into account. And they sound really nice in the display board and you put it in a car and all of a sudden the mid range is distant and cold and sterile. And that's not what we're looking for. So the, the three inch in this kit situation does share some technology with the thesis. It has a Neo magnet, it has a copper sleeve inside to do the on it's actually a copper sleeve on the pole piece which is how we decided to manage inductance on the ow i got a cramp in my leg pardon me well i'll tell you what you want to take a second ken and i think phil do you have this one ready to go of course i do come on okay let's go to phil so that ken can stretch out all right what is that there that's that that's the six and a half i imagine yeah, six and a half inch. All right. And that one has a paper 
polycomposite cone that is water resistant, but it isn't TPX. Um, that just didn't fit into the, um, the project. And it is a, uh, uh, it does have a vent on the back and it's got a regular ferrite uh, magnet. But you can see it's not that deep. It's still a cast frame and it's not that deep. And so we found that the, this has been a very popular speaker. We've had it in our line for quite a while. Um, it does come with a grill. And then the tweeter, um, one of the things you'll notice about, oh, look at that. It's got the spacer built in. So if you show them the, the tweeter fill and rotate it to show the depth, there is a little chamber on the back of the tweeter, but it's not nearly like what you see on the thesis. And that's why we can fit this into a lot of OEM locations. Hmm. And it, it, but it's not the tiniest tweeter, right? It's not like one of those half ohm jobs that you see in some of the, the, the very entry level speakers. But it seems to be a really good compromise from what we hear on our dealers in terms of being able to fit it into a lot of factory locations, even if you have to front load it. And it is one of my favorite tweeters because of how mechanically robust it is and how it can play so low. Cool. I like the fact that it comes with the two grills too, got options. You can keep it open face, you can cover it. All right. Like a sandwich. And I noticed now that there is a design signature here that with the uh, four branch basket design. Yes, uh, one of the things, and basket design, I always kind of discounted it, but they take it really seriously back in Italy. And one of the things that the basket design uh, is looked at is they want to make sure that they don't compress the air coming out the sides and cause a limitation of the speaker when it's playing louder. They don't want it to compress because of air pressure. Um, also, there's also the, the cast frame. If you hang a magnet off a cast frame and then you bolt it to a door and you drive down the road, the, flexibil the, the flex of the frame is a lot less than a stamp frame. So there's there's... The, the theory is that you get less deformation of the magnetic field around the voice coil when you have a cast frame. I don't know of a good way to measure it, but that's that's certainly the, the, the theory behind cast frames. I like that when I screw it into a door, it's really hard for me to screw up and bend the cast frame when I'm using my, my power drill because I'm, I'm a terrible installer. Um, <laughs> but You feeling better, Ken? We're good to continue? Yeah, thanks for that. I'm, All right, um, no worries. Let's get back to it. Ben, you're a, you're, a, you're a demanding interviewer. I've never had to stretch out during one of these before. I try to, I try to operate at your level, sir. All right. So let's, so let's go ahead. And, and now that we've talked about the Voce speakers and, and their specialty, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and let's talk about bit processors. And I'm not going to talk about all the bit processors because that's not the purpose of, of today's discussion. Um, but I would like to talk about the um, the virtuoso. We should change camera. Oh yeah, we're coming. We're going to go back yeah, to uh, the presentation now. <laughs> the squirrels right, are getting us there. There we go. I could I could oh. lip sing it, but it's not going to look good. <laughs> He's going to translate it into French. So. The Virtuoso is actually a derivative of our Bit1 HD processor that we came out with a few years before. And the Bit1 HD is a really great flagship processor in terms of hardware. And while the software really resembled a lot of our older software, it did some things that our software hadn't done before. Um, but the Bit1 HD name was really confusing because an awful lot of dealers heard that and said, oh, it's a Bit1 that does HD. And I think if we had it to do over again, we probably would have named the product differently. So what we did here was we went ahead and um, we made a, a design decision to upgrade all of the board level parts to thesis quality and reposition this as the Bit1 HD Virtuoso, which is the longest name of any product we have. But the Virtuoso has some things that just aren't available in other DSP processors. And so I'm going to go ahead and show you a couple of those. And then we'll look at one in a moment. I think we have one. Um, the Bit Virtuoso has 12 inputs. And at the time that it was introduced, that was the most uh, inputs of any DSP that was available. And it has 13 outputs. Now, traditionally, our DSPs had operated in a summing mode where you were required to sum front speakers together and then sum rear speakers together. And what we did with Virtuoso was we built in a pass-through mode 
that would allow you to take this processor, put it in an OEM application, pass through all 12 channels that you wanted to amplify. Now, some factory systems have more than 12 channels, but you don't always need to amplify all of them. So uh, there's obviously some uh, strategy here. Then you could add a sub with the 13th output if your system didn't have a sub, and it would pull the sub base out of the channels that had the sub base and route it to your new subwoofer. Um, this processor has two Toslink outs. It does have our classic automatic DEQ, but you can also do the pass-through mode where it doesn't do that. Um, that's really important for some cars that have up mixers. Uh, most of the time, an up mix car will have two sets of rear speakers. And most DSP processors don't know what to do with two sets of rear speakers because they've just got a front and a rear mm -hmm. field defined in the software. But mm -hmm. if you use pass-through mode, you can actually have the rear speakers that are the stereo speakers and the rear speakers that are the surround uh, ambient speakers kept isolated from each other. This was also our first product that, and I believe this was the first product in the industry that did D-phase where you could connect it, it would analyze the signal, and it would recommend to you how to correct phase manipulation by the OEM before you went to the tuning process. And um, I was actually, uh, I had the, the, the good fortune to be involved in testing this product when it was in development, and uh, my, my Toyota head unit on the bench sure got a workout, but you can put connect that and it will detect the two all-pass filters on the head unit and it will give you recommended filters to correct them. It's like a smart and you phase can detection confirm that it works. Mm. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Now, we also at the same time had the ability in this product to adjust for time. So if there is delay present on any of the channels, it'll synchronize all the channels for you. And this is something that we have trickled. Both of these capabilities are something that we have incorporated into our AF Forza amplifiers that we just launched this year in a form, not the identical form, but the concept is there. Um, this also incorporated parametric equalization. This platform uh, went from graphic EQ, which is what's in the old bit one, to parametric EQ, but some of our dealers still are comfortable with graphic EQ, so we have a button, so you can go back to graphic EQ if you want. Um, but the parts in here are really nuts. The, the, the components that were selected were intended to elevate it to be a suitable companion for thesis. And in this picture, you can see that if you decide to go to the full DA approach that Justin mentioned earlier, that there are full DA ports on this processor, as well as to two Toslink inputs. So when we did that, we wanted to make it match with the thesis product that I mentioned earlier. And so here's what we ended up with with our audio specifications. Uh, this distortion has more zeros on it than I've ever seen before you get to an actual number. Um, the frequency response is up to 44K, which is uh, high, why it's high res certified. Um, the signal and noise is 104 dB on the main input and 110 dB on the optical input, which is again, far greater than we can ever benefit from in a moving car, but in a critical listening environment, this is uh, this is better than CD quality in many cases. The channel separation is 80 dB, which again, that's that's CD quality. That's something that's uh, far greater than than what we're going to be able to benefit from in most situations. And this last number isn't something that I think you need, but I think it's something that reflects the horsepower that we bring to the product. The delay is adjustable in four hundredths of a millisecond or six tenths of an inch and the Point only reason that zero four millisecond delay like are we actually down to that for yes precision? and i am not here to tell you that you're going to hear the difference when you make right. those changes in four hundredths of a millisecond what i'm telling you is that that's only possible because of the incredibly high sampling frequency right. of the shark micro or the shark dsp processor that we are using inside the product because the 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 quantization chunks of time in your delay settings are always driven by the sampling rate of your microcontroller. So um, if we go here, you can see that there's a, a picture of the board 
And even our uh, the basic capacitors are in the Silna series from Elna that have a, uh, they're, they were specially made, intended specifically for audio. And they're a little bit more, but that's what we used because we knew we were making an audio product here and we didn't want to, we wanted it to, to get every advantage we could. Uh, the probably propylene capa film capacitors are also intended for audio. We have some Burr Brown op amps that are specifically in the Sound Plus series for better performance. And then we have the Surus Logic uh, 8 channel, 24-bit, uh, 192K D to A converters. And then we have the Shark microcontroller. And the Shark microcontroller, it's, it's a floating point DSP. Most manufacturers, including in our lower cost products, we usually use fixed point DSPs. Floating point DSPs simply mean that they are a lot more flexible in how they can perform their calculations. And that's what allows us to do some of the things that we do with Virtuoso. And one of the things that we do with Virtuoso is we use, uh, we have a room correction method using an algorithm that we licensed from an Italian university called Percept. And what we're doing here is very similar to what happens when you buy a home theater receiver and you set it up and you connect the microphone to the home theater receiver and you hit the calibration button. What we do is we measure the response of the car, but we also measure the phase response of the car, not just the amplitude response. And we do that using our bit 10 measurement system. A lot of people think that the bit 10 measurement system actually tunes the car, but it turns out it's just the measurement system and the Virtuoso tunes itself using the instruction set we put into the Shark microcontroller. So along with getting left and right to match and along with getting the target response that we're looking for, Percept will also address phase anomalies that we want to, to uh, fix. So in that sense, Virtuoso is the most advanced DSP that you can get. So you're going on the record, last... Ken, saying audio grade DSP courtesy of Audison. So I just want to touch on a couple things about virtual so quickly. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think we're running out of time. So let's make no, let's no, make no, sure no, we, no, uh... no. Let's get this okay. part in. I want to hear what okay, Justin please. has to say here. I just, I just want to say, I, I mean, we're obviously, I don't want to get too techy on it. Um, but virtual also does some things in my personal experience from using DSPs that make it really advantageous. Um, in, in, in certain things, as in, I can compensate for base roll off extremely effectively in Virtuoso. I can compensate for a dynamic EQ in Virtuoso. And I have the ability to affect crossovers and filtering and EQ in Virtuoso without manipulating the output phase of my signal. Um, and just to let you guys know, you know, it requires almost four times the processing power to use these type of filterings completely done electronically than it does with an analog style filter. Um, and that is one you see on the bottom of the virtual. So we had that little icon that said FIR or finite infinite response filters um, versus an IIR filter. And that I know I'm getting a little techie, but just to give you guys the example, the, the output channel ability of the virtual. So itself drops um, when using the fur filters because of the sheer amount of processing power that's required to oh, you're, apply Justin, it, Justin is correct. If you use it in full FIR mode, you do yeah. lose some things. However, the current Virtuoso does use FIR in a number of instances mm -hmm. without a channel penalty. So mm -hmm. that has that is a, an area that it has improved over the original uh, product. It is a very complex product, and we could have spent this entire show focusing on the the unique aspects that that virtuoso has um but i'm just glad i have one in my car lucky I you yeah i have it in my lap ah well you know <laughs> I, i'm sure there's benefits to both um so that said if we just got a couple of minutes left and i want to mention that we have what is essentially a high resolution source unit uh we're not a source unit company a um, few people think of us as being a source unit company but what we recently did is we came out with a product called the Beacon, which is a high fidelity Bluetooth module. And if you use a device with LDAC, an LDAC high res codec, you can get 96K throughput 
through from a, a device running LDAC. If you use it with an iPhone, which is the most popular device out there, you're not going to get high res from anybody with an iPhone because iPhones won't put out high res wirelessly. Mm -hmm. But it does support AAC for iOS, which is 48K capable. Um, it has a switching Toslink through, and it has a feature called Absolute Volume, which will be the last feature I explain for you today. Absolute Volume allows us to connect our phone to the... Um, the Beacon, and the Beacon can connect to Virtuoso, and soon it will also be able to connect to AF Forza. And when you pair your phone and set it up in absolute volume mode, what will happen is the volume buttons become the volume control for the amp, for the oh. processor. And the digital stream is unaffected by the volume commands. Uh, it, it has been shown that when you incorporate volume control over the digital stream, you can throw away up to half of oh, your so bits. Are we losing resolution with with that volume control? Yes, you are. And I won't pretend that you need all 24 bits of resolution in a moving car because that you probably don't have that much room before you get lost in the noise floor. But you don't want to throw away performance if you don't need to. And so the Beacon, when you connect it in absolute volume, the volume buttons stop controlling the digital stream and they start sending volume up, volume down commands down a serial cable to our processor. So if you go Beacon, in, if you go from your Sony Walkman with LDAC or your Samsung phone with LDAC into a Beacon, into a, a Virtuoso, into Thesis amplifiers or Voce amplifiers, you're high res all the way through. Very much so. Still, and, uh, well, sorry, just real quick through this device, is there other um control options? Is that an app or is that just a simple Bluetooth connection? It's a simple Bluetooth connection, okay. but the, the way that it controls the um, the way that it controls the volume is based in how the pairing occurs. So it's something that you take care of at the, at the moment of pairing. Here is a chart that we did showing the frequency response. Uh, that we were able to achieve with LDAC, which is, you can see it gets out here to 40K. And then with Apple AAC, right, um, the purple line is going out to 20K. So while we know that Bluetooth in, inflicts a penalty, uh, using these codecs, we were able to get performance that we think is better than what you're going to get from other Bluetooth devices that don't support AAC if you have an iPhone or don't support LDAC in high resolution mode. So as you know, Ben, other than that, I've got nothing. Dude, that, <laughs> that, I think this was the most intense, most explicit and detailed presentation we have gone through yet. And I, I know people are going to appreciate this for sure. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much, Ken, for putting together what an, like a really in-depth like, wow, you went overboard, and we love it. We, we love you for that. So let's go ahead and take away the presentation. We'll wrap this up right now. Um, guys, if you followed along and, and been listening to this, there's a section of this show. You can go back, watch it, stop it, re replay it. He has covered everything. You need to know. If you need more information on Audison products, let's put up. Well, let, let me do this. Let me do this. Let me first say bye to our guests here. So, Ken, thank you so much for coming in. Of course, we always appreciate it. And we do look forward for our, we do have another session for that other Electro Media brand that we'll be talking about soon enough. So Great we'll see to you see you guys. Soon. Take care, Ken. See you later, man. Hey, bye, Ken. Justin, I'm going to say bye to you real quick. Uh, again, uh, thank you so much for coming in. And uh, I know you're happy because now you got like this full line of product that uh, you're pretty excited Yeah, cool. It's fun to play that. with, right? It's, Absolutely. Uh, it's exciting. We're an excitement-based industry. Unfortunately, we're not a necessity to live so no we're all about fun i've been going is is, is perfect. We, we sell emotion 100 percent. and last but not least phil excellent job on the vanna white duties can't get oh, better than that that's top notch i've been told that i can keep all the samples and put it in my car so can't get on it now <laughs> so, oh wow if that's all you got to do to get thesis apps sign me up all right guys thank you so much for being with us today thank you man. take care all right, so real quick, let's put up some information for you. If you're looking for more detail, I don't know how much more detail you need than what we went through today, but Audison products can be found at audison.eu. It's an international site. Make sure you choose the right language. And if you happen to be a dealer in Canada, get a hold of the team at Auto Mobility Actively Seeking. Yes, you heard me. 
actively seeking new accounts in your region for Audison's a hot brand with a lot of hot ticket items. Get a hold of them and they will set you up. On that note, let's go ahead and quickly remind everybody, if you're into this kind of geeky stuff and you want to learn more, stay with us here on CME Networks. We are doing the audio file sessions straight through till November 10th. Check out that, I mean, look at that poster. Every brand you can think of in high end. It's amazing. We're so proud of ourselves. We're so happy to have this type of support. And we need you to join and tune in to make sure we keep this going. Now, on that note, if you're into high end, then you obviously know about Master Tech Expo going down next spring in uh, Mesa, Arizona. We're giving away two all-inclusive trips, free to register. Just head over to our website, cmanetworks.com, slash giveaway to sign up. We're giving away a, a complete trip for a winner in Canada, as well as one in the U.S. So everybody can go ahead and sign up. And last but not least, make sure you check out cmanetworks.com for more great videos that we've done with Automobility, as well as with Ken Ward and Audison. Thanks for tuning into this CMA Connected presented by Sirius XM. I'm your host, Ben Wu. Until next time, we connect. Roll it down. I am. You don't need a car to listen to Sirius XM. You can listen anywhere. You know that, right? What? Kevin Hart's loud radio. <laughs> Kevin, you could use your phone. What? What? Alexa, play Kevin Hart's Laugh Out Loud radio on Sirius XM. What? This is how I know you're getting old. I guess that was it. What? <laughs>